First of all, it's important to understand that that distinction between industrial agriculture and just agriculture in general is pretty subtle. It's a lot more subtle than people think it is. So they like to denigrate industrial agriculture as being the root of all our problems when in fact agriculture is, period. And the, the, that slippery slope that we are on right now, we started walking on that 10,000 years ago. And it is because of an inherent problem in agriculture. Um, I'll use the word catastrophic, as I always do when I'm talking about that, because it, it, it has real meaning in this case. It's a, it's a precise biological term, and I use it as biologists use it. What it means is that, um, that the, the, the vegetation, or not just the vegetation, but the ecosystem is reduced to zero. And it happens during natural catastrophes, when a flood comes and wipes out everything in its path, or a fire and, and, or a volcano, and it literally sterilizes the place. Um, and when that happens in nature, when that occurs, there are specialized plants that come in and recolonize an area. They're annual grasses. And they have this unique strategy, very specialized, almost freaky strategy in nature. And what they do, instead of making long-term investments in a place, and it is an investment strategy. They do a very short-term strategy, which is to put shallow roots down, take as much sunlight in that first year as they possibly can, and invest it all into seed, because they have to be carried on the seed because of catastrophe. That's what survives. Well, it turns out we can use that seed as humans, or any seed eater can. And as a result of that, agriculture really depends on disturbance. Um, if we're to harvest those seeds from those few freakish plants that are able to do that annual grass strategy, then we have to create the disturbance that would normally be created by a volcano or a fire or something like that. And so what we do essentially is plow. Everybody knows that plow began agriculture. Well, that's to create that disturbance, to cycle that ecosystem down to zero. And so it's the artificial catastrophe that occurs every single year in agriculture for 10,000 years. What a lot of people don't realize about the implications of catastrophic agriculture is it's inherent to agriculture. It's inherent to agriculture. It, there's, there's no way you can do agriculture without doing that catastrophic damage. So the term sustainable agriculture becomes oxymoronic in that light. I mean, uh, people do organic agriculture and suggest they're doing a good thing or is that somehow sustainable. Well, it's better. There's no doubt about it. But often, even if they're multi-cropping, they'll put four or five species of plants in a place where there were once 200 species of plants. And it requires those additional inputs. Um, so it makes agriculture fundamentally unsustainable. Uh, and that, it's been that way for 10,000 years. We ate as a species. We had food before us for all of our history, which is 200, 300,000 years. When you look at 10,000 years, it's relatively minor in that, in that space. But we were hunter-gatherers. And so nature grew our food in its way as opposed to our way, which is agriculture. Um, we didn't grow food, food grew. And we were like every other species of animal that we went out and, and took what was available to us, which tended to be a surplus. Um, and that surplus um, could be sustainable because nature does produce some sort of surplus. That's what all animals live on. It's when we started manipulating that system and, and, and in turn, through that catastrophe, compromising nature's systems to produce that we made things unsustainable. At the same time, we rapidly increased our need for humans. People usually put that backwards. They say agriculture allowed population to increase. I'm sorry. What really happened is we had a need for excess humans because agriculture is dependent on stoop labor. A whole lot of poor people who go out and do the work to feed rich people. So that kind of social inequity began almost immediately with agriculture. We know that from archaeological sites from all around the world, that if you go to pre-agricultural towns, you'll see a series of houses all about the same size. And almost instantly when agriculture occurred, you can go to any town in any agricultural site in the world, not just in Western culture, and see a few very large houses with granaries connected to them and a whole series of smaller houses. 
What that meant was that we had to, to sustain that system, increase the availability of stoop labor population. And we had the ability to do it with grains, because grains are very dense packages of energy, and you can sustain people on 200 calories a day of grain quite easily. It increased population so drastically, and it has increased in that one steady climb since the beginning of agriculture, that we now have excess population, which is our fundamental environmental problem on the world. We've overpopulated our range. That's a direct result of agriculture. And, and, and so we can look at that big supply of grain and say, well, this must be a modern phenomenon, that, that we've degenerated to this level of population. Um, surplus, that so many of us are forced to live that way, but in fact it's not. That that sort of grain rule diet has been with us ever since agriculture. And we can now go from the subjective, I mean what we think about as quality of life, to the objective, because it's measurable, the effects that that had on humans. If we look at archaeological sites around the world, and people have done this, in all the locations, this is not a cultural issue, in all the locations where agriculture began in Asia, in the Mideast, in South America, and Central America, in every case, archaeologists can find um, skeletal remains of agricultural people and contemporaneous hunters and gatherers, people who lived at the same time. And in every case, the hunter-gatherers were larger, were much taller, they were not diseased, they didn't have teeth decay, all those issues. And if we look at the, at the agricultural people, we will find people who are stunted, short, their teeth are invariably gone because of the carbohydrates they're eating, turn into sugars and rot their teeth out. They're misshapen, they're asymmetrical, they show every evidence of suffering all sorts of disease. Uh, one in particular, uh, one, one deformation in particular that keeps drawing my attention is it occurs in women. And it's a deformation of the pelvis that they find in agricultural people that it becomes misshapen and enlarged. And it took people forever to figure out what that came from. And it came from um, the act of grinding grain. That women would sit with a mortar and pestle for all their life doing this. And as a result of that, their bones became misshapen to accommodate that. We find nothing like that in hunter-gatherers who existed for all those thousands of years. We can begin talking about dehumanization in agriculture in modern times. And if we think about the one and a half to two billion people on the planet who are the poorest people on the planet, and think about their quality of life, it begins in their diet, what they're able to eat. And the way we're able to support that many people is to take, uh, take our ability to raise grain in abundance and feed them strictly that. So if you are one of those people, then you can expect to diet 2,000 calories a day. If you're very lucky, more like 1,500 calories a day of straight grain. So you're going to get a bowl of rice, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, if you're lucky. That Humans aren't involved for that sort of diet. That's a really awful diet, and it's short in micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, all those things you need to get by. But it's also short in that kind of, not even short, it's completely lacking in that variety that we all count on every day to make our lives, to give our lives some quality. 